Morning. Woo! Get my blood pumping. And this, on that note, I'm out. See ya. <laughs> this is an introduction to Software Defined Radio and the Wireless Village. And the importance between these two talks, or these two concepts for this talk, is uh, the SDR stuff. We debuted it at DEF CON last year for us, and we had some pretty good uh, presenters. Uh, and players and all that sort of stuff, and we're hoping to bring everyone in this room into there mm, throughout the conference, not at once, so don't rush it. Um, so who we are? Well, who we are is not entirely too important, but what we do for you is. And what we do for you uh, is provide a safe uh, environment that you can uh, practice all the Wi-Fi stuffs and the SDR stuffs for contests and uh, general experimentation. Uh, I'm Satan Claus, this is Kahuna. Doc Kahuna, and uh, one thing to note is when you do it, when do it with us, we keep it legal. Yep. So remember that. One of the things you also need to remember, it's not just the two of us. There's a lot of people in the background that helps us with this either year. Uh, some of them are here, some of them are not here. Some of them are up getting the wireless village set up now, going through all the contest stuff. Their names are here. Not going to read through them, but uh, definitely come on if you up see and meet us. Yeah, if you see them, say hello, buy them a drink. Especially the girls; they do a wonderful job. So, for the next uh, forty-five minutes, we're going to cover a variety of different things to get you interested and able to uh, be prepared to play uh, in the contest over in the village. It's not just hardware; uh, it's also understanding regarding some basic uh, radio communication concepts. And one of the many things that we see that get people gummed up or jammed up in the competitions that we have is the uh, lack of understanding of the physical layer components of radio, which is radio, interestingly enough. So we're, uh, the agenda for what we're going to be coming over for you uh, is right there. We're going to establish some basic knowledge. How many hams do we have in the room? Yay? Awesome sauce. How keep many hams are going, are going to become after this conference in this room? How many people are going to take an exam if they're going to be able to? All righty. Okay, point of vanity. All the hams, raise your hands again. All the hams, raise your hands. Uh, <laughs> all of you that are extra, keep your hands up. Those of you that are not, keep your hands down. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> yes, yeah. mics are dead. Ironically, wireless. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> right. Who's jamming us? Yeah. All righty. So the clicker's next. All right. Don't be concerned if you didn't bring what you need to participate in the contest we're having with you. There are vendors in the vendor area, some of the ones that we know and have worked with or listened to here, as well as there is a huge Fry's Electronics here in Las Vegas, and it's not that far away. Uh, we go there at least once every year because we find something we forgot. So oh, I'm, I'm going to keep rolling. Uh, what I'm going to talk about next is transceivers. Those of you that are hams are familiar with these. These are what's called good. fixed transceivers, uh, and they're amateur radio transceivers. Frequencies they operate on are HF, UHF, VHF, um, and sometimes multi-mode. Output power is about 100 to 200 watts standard. They run off AC. Some of them can run off DC for mobile, but these are usually what are in your base stations and cost factor is about $1,000 and up. Next is mobile. A lot of people do mobile. In your car, you'll find uh, some of us have radios mounted in our car. Uh, these work a lot better than trying to use an HT in your car because your car is pretty much a Faraday cage. So you'll see these mounted under the dashboard in the trunk with remotes and stuff. Uh, output power is a little bit less than the others, 40 to 50 watts. They run off 12 volts T DC typically. And the cost factor is a lot easier. I do know some people that use these for base stations. It's kind of a low entry point into HF radio and VHF and UHF. Not last but least are what's called handy talkies or HT. These are handheld transceivers. Uh, these things are amazing. Uh, most people that get their first license get a technician class license. You can use these two meters, four meters, uh, uh, two meters, 70 centimeters, and cost any, you can get these little bow funks for about $35. It'll last a long time. If it breaks, oh well, I bricked a couple of them trying to get them to operate on some weird frequencies and stuff. It's 35 bucks, go buy another one. Some of the high end Japanese ones, the ICOMs, Yesus, will run you up to a couple hundred dollars. 
And for those of you that just have an interest, don't know if you're interested or not, uh, there is a workshop that's going to be going on here. You can find it in the schedule. It's going to be talking about Hamsphere. Hamsphere is a virtualized amateur radio um, area where you can go in. It's done across the Internet. Uh, it's an install client on uh, Windows. It's JAR files, so it runs on both Mac and Linux. Uh, and you can get a free 30-day trial license on it and you can play around with it. And you do not need an amateur radio license to work on this because it's not really transmitting over the air. It's a virtualized environment. But again, go to the workshop if you're interested in this. So the wonderful little bit is the components of software-defined radio. You can actually replicate all the things that you've seen and um, managed out of uh, uh, the typical ham radio, hardware radios with a variety of software-defined radios. And you can uh, deal with pro uh, kits anywhere between when you start buying them in bulk, uh, between $10, typically sold for $20, the RTL, all the way up to the Hack RF. And then this is not a camera because it is a Blade RF. Uh, the different radios have different ca uh, capabilities. Uh, be aware of the capabilities and restrictions. Uh, the reason for this and being very specific about it is at the, uh, in the village we have some challenges that are built specifically for you need to have a hack RF to solve the challenge or you need to have a blade RF to solve the challenge or you need to have a USRP to solve the challenge because we're using that as a method to teach you the differences between the tools based upon their capabilities. But don't worry, the prizes are typically the inverse of it. So if you had a Blade RF, you're not going to win a Blade RF uh, if you win the Blade RF challenge. Um, outside of that, you have a uh, cost as a major delineator between uh, the variety of different tools that are available to you. Uh, if this is going to be something new for you, just start off with the uh, Realtek RTL SDR. Uh, you can buy them up in the vendors and in the village for the challenges uh, for the SDR ones. Uh, that will probably get you about maybe 60% of the available flags. Uh, so it's easy for you to get into. Uh, the complication of that is the degree of madness that I dive into uh, the creation of the flags. However, these things are out there. Uh, this is an awareness campaign on that part. Stop by the village if you even want to see them in demonstration as well. Uh, and because they now have speech detects, I have to say supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Wait for it. Oh, <laughs> XP. <laughs> nice try. Some of the uses of these handheld transmitters are uh, various modes of. <laughs> She's going to get it, get it, get it, get it. Ah. Oh. Anyhow, uh, the handheld transceivers and stuff like that is uh, you can do satellite communications. Where's the uh, red squiggly mark? There's a, there, there's a lot of that. Uh, Earth, Moon, Earth. Earth, Moon, Earth is interesting. You're actually using the moon as a reflector, send an RF signal up, it hits the moon, it bounces back down a long ways away. Packet radio is basically doing the internet over RF, uh, except point to point. Radio teletype, which I did many, 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 many years ago, is simply the old BODOT code. You're sending radio signals across RF. And Internet uh, Radio Linking Project is something fairly new. It's been around for a few years. I'm just getting into it. But essentially, you use a low-power handheld transceiver, and you call to a repeater. That repeater hooks to the Internet until another repeater many, many miles away, and then it transmits to someone that you're talking to on the other. The way they do that is the repeaters have uh, four-digit IDs, and that's part of the transmission that you use, dual-tone multifrequency encoded. You tell it what the code is in those four tones, and that's how it recognizes and know which repeater to send to across the Internet. And not last but, le last but not least is my absolute favorite International Morse Code, probably the oldest means of communication via radio waves around. Works fine, lasts a long time not subject to interference and all that other stuff. It'll power through anything. And in a last-ditch resort, for those of you that are uh, real preppers, you should learn Morse code and get a amateur radio license. Before you jump onto the next slide, the uh, last thing I'd like to add on to this one is that in the uh, challenges and in some of the many uh, disciplines of software-defined radio, as you're going to be jumping around the frequency ranges and looking and trying to demodulate stuff, a lot of these basic principles that you will learn as a ham radio operator directly apply in one way or another when looking at signals and doing SIGINT analysis. So for instance, Morse code is one-on-one -on -one with OOK on-off keying. 
So you may see like a key fob trans, uh, transmitter using OOC, and if you have a background or understand what Morse code is, this is a very easy concept to extrapolate off of. Very similarly, the stuff with the RTTY stuff, things along this line. So the other components that we have available to you uh, regarding the challenges and the importance of the different uh, SDR platforms is the ability to transmit and receive, and whether or not it's full duplex or half duplex transmit. Uh, or receive. So with the RTL, it's only receive only. Uh, the HackRF will do uh, transmit and receive, and it's hugely affordable, but it's uh, half duplex. The Blade RF will do both of those things, but it's full duplex. Uh, so for instance, if you are uh, trying to analyze uh, cellular communications, you can do it with both, but if it requires you to interact uh, with a device, you would more than likely need to lean, well, you would need to lean on the Blade RF because of the full duplex component. Uh, similarly, the USRP I describe as generally being the nuke regarding all this sort of stuff because not only is it a little bit more expensive, well, it is a more expensive than the rest of these things, but it also has some modular uh, boards that you can buy, so it's a very dynamic platform. Uh, so as you progress through these things, these are the recommendations that I would give to you as to how you can progress into uh, software-defined radio. And then you also have a variety of other dirty little things that you can do, like, for instance, turn your Raspberry Pi and other devices into transmitters. Uh, we do some things along those lines, and you can even modify the code to do. Uh, the, the normal one is Pi FM. It does wideband FM. But you could also fairly easily modify to do CW or, um, or technically AM mode and uh, narrowband FM as well. So if you're feeling adventurous enough, this stuff is already out there. Um, POC or GTFO has a write-up regarding all that sort of stuff. Just make sure you get the right pie. Exactly. Uh, the latest versions of the pies have quote-unquote fixed the bug. Um, but you can still purchase the older ones and they still make them as well. So this is where I'm going to kind of start taking a devious rant regarding the SDR stuff. And typically, when I broke into this, um, learning software-defined radio, it was uh, typically a two-step process, similar to this slide of how to draw an owl. You know, you draw two kind of overlapping circles, and you draw the rest of the damn owl. Uh, <laughs> there was not very much clearly articulated and easy to follow steps in between those two major uh, components. Because I would see these talks and, and I didn't really realize that there was a lot of other magic happening in the background. So what we hope to be able to uh, resolve regarding our classes here at DEF CON, uh, we're providing workshops. They're classroom environments. So bring your equipment, follow along with presenters, uh, and work it with them. So that's going to be a huge major difference that uh, we've done from the past. So the, uh, the thing to remember the, about software-defined radio is that there's pretty much just a straight-up radio front end, and keeping this as simple as possible. It goes through uh, eight, uh, analog to digital or digital to analog converter, depending on whether or not it's uh, uh, transmit and receive, um, and you can read the rest of the slides. However, uh, what you're essentially doing is capturing a variety of uh, frequencies off uh, uh, the air, converting it uh, from analog to digital, and dumping it across into a machine that's going to be able to interpret it for you in a variety of different ways. The um, next slide. So the the thing that gums a lot of people up when they're first now uh, trying these things is that they think that oh I can just uh, buy like you know <laughs> actually I have a very fun email chain regarding this very uh, subject. But uh, what's the difference between what we understand about Wi-Fi packet interceptions and software-defined radio? Uh, well, it's not really a packet. It's uh, uh, raw I and Q samples, and I'm getting a moment ahead of myself. But the, the thing to remember is that with a Wi-Fi adapter, it's got firmware running on that radio. And it's going to be doing Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi really, really well. Yeah, you can do Wi-Fi with an SDR, but there's going to be a huge tax. And I haven't seen anything past uh, uh, AO211B be ridiculously reliable. Um, you can do it with some of the other platforms, but you could either buy this for $20 or a USRP for $2,500 to do Wi-Fi. Anyways, so pick the right tool for the right thing. Next slide. So you got to remember uh, how it presents the information to you, and it presents the information to you in two components, I and Q. And these are measures of uh, the signal out of phase of each other so that you can reassemble uh, the communication and a, a fun little program 
um, called GNU Radio Companion, which is kind of like the Lego block programming of, um, or the Lego Dactor or something similar of uh, uh, software-defined radio. Uh, GNU Radio Companion, there's a whole series of classes involving that in the village, I believe, this year, um, because it's, uh, I personally also, it's a fantastic tool. There's a lot of weird things to have to understand about it. But in some degree, I also feel like it's a little bit of gradware. In other words, it worked for me. I don't care if it worked for you or not. Uh, different versions of it, uh, you can take the same sketch, GRC sketch, which is what you use to generate your receiver or transceiver, um, and give it to someone else, and it just doesn't work on their machine. And typically, that could be either different Python versions or different uh, GNU Radio uh, companion versions. So it's getting better. It's made massive strides uh, as the uh, community has moved forward. Um, but the, uh, uh, what you're going to need to do and understand with GNU Radio Companion is how you're collecting that information. So choose your weapon wisely, per se. And uh, it has to do with how many samples and how, in other words, how many uh, digits in that uh, floating point number are important to you for what it is you're decoding or demodulating. Um, also, your frequency uh, ranges are also equally important. Uh, I've, um, there's a, a neat little effect that happens uh, with software-defined radio where sometimes, while in the real world, uh, you don't get any, um, uh, shoot, I'm trying to remember the word. Uh, essentially, it's false signals. Uh, but in the, uh, what's that? Harmonics. Harmonics, thank you. It is morning, and I haven't had anything really to kick me up awake yet. Um, but the, um, uh, the software component of it can sometimes lie to you, so be aware of that. So sometimes it's better to have two tools to help you out. Um, and last but not least, I've seen some other people feel like that they had the right tool in order to find out that they weren't able to remotely tune to what it is that they were looking for. And subsequently to that, they may have found the signal from it, but they're actually measuring the harmonic from it, which is not so good. Next slide. So the, uh, as I gave an interlude to, or an allusion to uh, at the beginning, the physical layer component of this stuff, the antenna piece to this is very important to understand. Uh, when we were at DerbyCon last year, we had a uh, fox and hound activity that occurred and no one found it because these people had their very directional uh, antennas and they didn't understand that the, uh, uh, there was a side lobe that uh, made the antenna uh, say that the signal was stronger, moving pretty much up and over behind their shoulder when they were trying to hold it in front of them. So they thought the fox was in a, um, a restaurant that was closed when in fact it was in our room the whole weekend. So they're pointing it up at the restaurant and they think it's at the restaurant when in reality the strongest part of the signal was shooting up and over behind them. Um, so test your gear, know your gear, understand some of the basic concepts regarding radio communications. antenna system and so this is where I kind of get my geek on uh, I built these things I've designed these things uh, I used to enjoy just taking a random piece of wire and tuning it but there's three basic components to a uh, antenna system you've got your transmitter that we've talked about you also have a matching coil which is sometimes needed sometimes may not be and then a random length of wire or a tune length of wire and the length of the wire that you need is determined by the wavelength, which is the operating frequency that you're working at. So antenna systems, the things to remember is the antenna must match the transmitter frequency. It also has the ways to do that is you can prune the length of the antenna. You can use an antenna tuner to use a single antenna over multiple frequencies. Or you can create what's called a matching section, which is usually an inductor and a capacitor in parallel that you can use that basically tunes it. Another important factor is the polarization. Optimum transfer of a magnetic wave, electromagnetic wave takes place when the transmit and the receive antennas are of the same polarization. There's essentially three polarizations. Horizontal, that means the electrical component is going this way. Vertical, it's going this way. And then circular, which is most often used in satellite communications, or helix, uh, is it's actually operating a little bit in both at different times. So crash course, 
The frequency here, if you know the speed, and essentially to determine, the way I like to think of it is, you know what frequency you want, so the frequency will determine the length. And what the standard is, is about 300, or the speed of light, 300 million feet per second, or meters per second. Yeah. Geek. <laughs> Divided by frequency in megahertz will give you the wavelength in meters. And the speed can be determined, and that's the frequency in megahertz. But these charts are easy. It's all over the things, and it's one of the fundamental questions that ham radios have to talk about. So what are the main characteristics of an antenna? There's three main characteristics. Reciprocity. That is the ability of the antenna to transmit as well as receive. You want to be able to use an antenna to transmit well and receive well. Then there's gain factors. And anytime you have gain, you also have loss. I have seen antenna systems that put more loss in than they did gain because they weren't matched or they used the wrong impedance for the coaxial cable. Somebody grabbed cable TV cable instead of RF cable. 75 ohms, 50 ohms makes a difference. And then the polarization. So gain is the ability of an antenna to increase the signal strength or to transfer the energy, the RF, into the RF electrical magnetic wave. When you have gain, you're measuring if, like the cantennas everybody uses for wireless and stuff, are typically 14 dBi. That means that that antenna gives you a 14 decibel gain over a measured isotropic antenna, and the isotropic antenna that's normally used is a quarter wavelength at that operating frequency. Who has a, um, a nice little RF anechoic chamber that they can test their own cantinas and, and all that sort of stuff. Awesome. So know your radio antenna, uh, because uh, I've seen so many of them be poorly performed and people just follow the instructions and they're just clipped or bad solder joint. And you'll see more on that later. And then antenna polarization. As I said, they're, they're horizontal, vertical, circular, and it is the electrical component of the electromagnetic wave that determines what the polarization is, as you can see in the diagram there. Essentially, all antennas boil into two types. They're either omnidirectional or they provide some directionality. Omnidirectional, I like to say, radiates equally poor in all directions, but they are very, very useful. Uh, a lot of times in doing fox, and, fox hunts and stuff, you use an omnidirectional once you get very, very close. Once you get very, very close, your directional antenna starts looking at harmonic side lobes and stuff. So I found using a low gain uh, omnidirectional kind of helps me a lot in those situations. Uh, it's also useful in most mobile applications. People that put these verticals, magnetic verticals, like I use for war driving on top of their cars, uh, those are omnidirectional because you want to pick up signals from everywhere. When you get to directional signals, you can see here, you can see where it's showing the amount of uh, decibel gain over the isotropic, and this is just a radiation pattern chart. You'll also see those side lobes that Rhett mentioned off there, so you can determine why some people may think an antenna or transmitter is over here when actually it's over here, or they may think it's over there when it's over here. So... You need to know your antenna systems, how they operate, and what characteristics they provide. Speaking of characteristics, there is a sky wave. Sky wave is usually what's used for uh, most very long haul uh, transmissions. Radio waves, when you transmit a radio wave, it goes everywhere indiscriminately based upon your antenna. When you use a directional antenna, you want to focus it that way. It's going to travel everywhere from the Earth's surface all the way to straight up and down, depending upon the design of the antenna. And some of that antenna, depending upon the frequency, will go up into the ionosphere and be reflected, refracted, uh, back to the Earth's surface at a greater distance. This is typically happens in the high-frequency bands, but sometimes happens at UHF, even VHF frequencies. There's also a characteristic of a radio wave that it will tend to reflect off buildings. You get this a lot in uh, using the handhelds and stuff like that in cities where you've got buildings with glass walls. Those 
walls will act as a reflector and it will reflect the signal around the building. There may be a building between the transmit and receiver and you not know that it's there because the signal is being reflected around it. By the same thing, non-flat surfaces, there's a, a characteristic called refraction where it tends to bend. This is what gives you some signals that will go like uh, over the curvature of the earth, beyond line of sight. Okie dokie. So we're going to change topics slightly a little bit more and focus more on the SDR stuff, taking uh, some of the information that you just got from John regarding the antenna theory things. So the, the, the thing that I've observed in new students and people trying these sort of uh, challenges uh, is that, uh, that they mismatch their antenna system. They will take their omnidirectional antenna and extend it as far as humanly possible uh, for a signal that uh, has a waveform propagation that is nowhere remotely near uh, what it is that they're picking up. So what do you do when you do that? You introduce extra noise into your uh, signal uh, that you're capturing. So make sure that you have the right uh, antenna system for it because it, in addition uh, to that, there are instances in which um, when you capture too much RF energy, you can blow things like preamps or the receiver in it. And I'll get into a little bit more detail in that in a moment. Um, there you go. So the uh, software side of the things, let's uh, focus on some of the things that you'll want to be able to use in this challenge, uh, in this uh, sort of a environment. Uh, yep, there are billions of tools, well, not billions, thousands, hundreds of tools. Um, the, uh, but the two main ones that I've seen people lean on uh, for just signal identification has been primarily GQRX and SDR Sharp. Uh, one is Linux OS X, uh, SDR Sharp is definitely Windows. Uh, yeah, you can run it in Linux and OS X, but we have some political reasons as to why we don't do that anymore. Um, and the, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, GNU Radio Companion uh, and, uh, is pretty much the really deep dive go-to tool when you need to start to, uh, using a microscope for um, uh, the signal uh, that you're looking at. Well, what about the signals? So your, your brain is a really fantastic computer. Um, the majority of the time that I now do SIGINT is based on listening to what I'm hearing first and then taking a look at what I'm seeing on a waterfall uh, so you have a better time domain uh, sort of representation of the uh, signal that you're looking at. And then you can go to this website where they have the SIGINT wiki where you can listen to other things that, are, uh, that people have captured uh, done some reversing already. Uh, they tell you where the uh, where they were geographically when they picked up that signal. Uh, they also give you the time, and I think they're now starting to capture weather characteristics as well. Uh, but they also give you an audio sample and a waveform sample, so you can then compare it back and forth. So it makes things a whole lot more easier and quicker to identify what it is you're looking at, uh, just solely based upon hearing it and then subsequently seeing it. So. Uh, go to that website, familiarize yourself with some of the uh, more common uh, communication mechanisms that are out there. And once you kind of know what you're looking at and know what you're dealing with, it actually becomes very quickly a, a smooth sailing sort of situation after that. The, um, uh, oh, I already mentioned the slide. But uh, the one thing I do also want to mention on this was uh, uh, another really fantastic tool called Bodline. Uh, that allows you to um, more easily dive into the raw capture files. Bodline has some goofy characteristics about it, uh, one of which is uh, file size that are greater than 50 megabytes, but there's uh, some fun hacks that you can do in order to uh, get around that using file system, uh, so FIFOs on your uh, file system. And anyways, it, it just gets complicated. However, uh, the additional tools that are... Um, based upon uh, the software side of things, like the plug and play to de decoding demod. Uh, demod. Uh, you have DSD, Multimod NG, and SmartNet Scanner. Um, pretty much a lot of these tools will do all the AFSK, FSK, OOK, and all that sort of stuff out of the box for you, ready to go, without having to do a deep dive GRC sketch um, or any other real heavy lifting. Um, the uh, Next slide. All righty. So the, this is not a Linux-only environment. You can also use Windows and OS X. Um, some of the tools are 
pretty well func uh, are, are functional, some are not, but uh, some of them also require other dirty little hacks. So for instance, with uh, Windows, you have to kind of do a loop back uh, for a virtual audio connector uh, with, between what you're actually capturing and then looping back into the software that you're using. Sometimes that costs money, sometimes it don't, uh, doesn't. I don't care, uh, I don't want to know. Uh, what you do on that one. However, um, the uh, one of the other more popular tools that's showing up uh, that's got a really good extensible set of plugins now is uh, SDR Sharp. You can Google it and find it for yourself. Alrighty, so let's talk about some of the things regarding these little devices that you need to be a little bit cautious of um, when using and operating. Um, those things, or also when you want to start testing this stuff at your house. Uh, so for the village, we have a variety of web pages that uh, have take-home exams and practice exams, so you can do this stuff at home and test it at home. And then once you start getting that scratch and that itch, you're going to probably be curious about the other things that are happening uh, around your residence uh, from a spectrum uh, RF transmission standpoint. So some of these things are lessons that I've learned and lessons that other people have learned. Uh, you have everything from the antennas that they come with to lightning, static noise, and clocks and drifts. So we'll get uh, right onto that. With the uh, typical RTLs, uh, when you buy them, they come with these like goofy little antenna nubs and all that sort of stuff. And I have seen, uh, I don't have any in there because they're all junk. Um, but many people uh, will uh, plug in their RTL and plug in the antenna that comes with it and they wonder why they're not really picking anything up at all. And that is a great photograph of an example as to why they don't pick anything up at all. Anyone see a problem with this? Um, it works better if you plug it in and then connect it. So in some cases, the um, solder is weak and with flexing and all that sort of stuff, it just snaps off. Other times, it's just not connected at all. Uh, so know your hardware, know your antenna, because that's exactly how you're going to be capturing this information coming in. What I recommend for people on the antenna stuff, you can leave it there, uh, is the, um, uh, the connector heads are MCX connector heads, and on various websites and at the vendors you can buy MCX to SMA adapters, and then you can take the SMA adapter and plug it directly into, uh, or screw it into your antenna uh, itself directly. On this slide, lightning wants to be your friend. Don't be lightning's friend. Um, the uh, uh, big thing to remember regarding your antenna systems is make sure if you're going to make it permanent and stand it up uh, uh, at your residence, pay attention to where lightning strikes are in your area, how frequently they are, the time of years that they come around. Otherwise, that will happen to you. And that was from an Ethernet-based radio uh, transceiver that I manage and the, uh, uh, the radio survived, and the rest of the Ethernet uh, system survived, the lightning arrestor survived, the ground bus survived, but the five-foot cord between the radio to the lightning bus or, uh, arrestor was brittle and toast. I'd rather replace a five-foot Ethernet cable than a you know, three to five hundred uh, or multi-thousand dollar radio or having to re-pull all that Ethernet uh, all over again. So no... Uh, uh, be cautious about lightning. Static is another issue. Uh, when you, uh, even on a nice, beautiful, windy day, uh, there can be static that's built up on your antenna feed system that sends a charge directly back into uh, your RTL or your radio. Um, rubbing it uh, will uh, generate static. So having, I've seen these things with the connectors in them, and the person moves the antenna, and from D message, you see it unplug and replug back in. And what's happened is that a static charge was delivered into the, uh, uh, the USB device, which subsequently delivers it into your computer, uh, which you don't want to have happen. So be careful regarding static. And an additional reason why you want to be careful about static is that sometimes these things do not come with a static protection diode. Uh, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Uh, so I would crack it open, test, and see. Uh, the uh, few more bits of information that you need to be aware about are uh, these, uh, there's two manuals here, um, and we also have them available on our website, or we link to them on our website, uh, is noise reduction. So people will turn on their RTLs, and we're um, dealing with someone right now uh, who thinks he sees all these sporadic signals, um, and it's either he's seeing clock sources out of his laptop or any other device around him, and it's frustrating sometimes. But um, 
you need to go through this procedure of identifying signals in your area and doing your best to reduce them. So that could be via shielding, chokes. Those two manuals have a lot of uh, information for you in order to reduce your noise. And one of the examples, or two examples of noise that I have for you is based upon BFG. It's not what you think, it's barrier, field, and ground. Um, the, uh, can anyone identify what the problem is with the image on the left, where the noise source is? Power cap. Yep, it's the power cap. Uh, the reason why it's the power cap, uh, and both of these examples came from the book, uh, the, uh, the second book uh, that I linked to earlier, is that that connector head is a plastic connector head, so it's not adequately uh, shielding uh, RF signal that's coming across the uh, ground bus into the actual computer itself. The device on the right, uh, who has ever dealt with uh, combining metals outside? There's generally a rule of you do not put uh, metals of different types next to each other outside for long periods of time because of rust. Can anyone identify the rust on that cap? It's based upon the ground bus going in underneath the cap. So that was actually a huge signal uh, source uh, for that particular um, radio system. The last few bits of information that you need to know is about the clocks. Uh, all these SDR platforms have clocks in them. Sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. Uh, the clocks in the RTLs are not that great. So what you need to uh, be aware of is that as the RTL warms up, your clock is going to drift. Uh, regarding the device. And so that's going to create a frequency offset for you when you're looking at the uh, radio sources. So I suggest that you go to the uh, NOAA weather um, station transmission sites in order to see what their center frequencies are to figure out your uh, offset. Speaking of clocks, uh, if you unify the clock sources uh, on the RTLs, you can do some really goofy things like being able to watch more uh, uh, or observe more frequencies at the same time. However, don't do that because it's unless you're really curious because it gets expensive. Um, and uh, the last little bits on uh, hardware mods. Go ahead. Is uh, I mentioned earlier that as it warms up, you're going to get some signal drift. Uh, I got some frequencies for you here in the area that you can try to establish what your frequency uh, drift is at. So one of the ways that you can manage that is by cooling your RTLs. One of the easiest ways to cool it and also to reduce some uh, noise is to put it into a paint can full of um, oil. Uh, if you use vegetable oil, make sure your pets don't get into it, otherwise you have two problems. Um, but it helps. These are all the goofy little things that you can do in order to get a little bit extra mileage out of your equipment. Uh, last but not least, uh, I, I refer to TSCM on the cheap. You need, uh, when you're coming to the village to compete, you need to know what the RF spectrum is looking light in order to be able to find the signals of interest. So you got that slide there, and essentially just know your radio network neighborhood and you're good to go. Last but not least, it's the village. And for the village, some of the workshops and presentations is going to be going on to the village uh, over the next two days, starting tomorrow, 10 o'clock, is shown here. So if any of these things, like hacking WPA Enterprise, uh, Zigbee, doing wireless penetration testing, GNU radio, lots of DSR, uh, uh, DSP for SDR. Uh, Hack5 is going to be there talking about their pineapple. Uh, got a unicorn in the world of Bluetooth going to come up and talk to us as well. <laughs> but um, regarding the challenges, we got all the Wi-Fi's, we got all the SDR's, we got mobile SDR challenges and Wi-Fi challenges as well, typical fox and hound sort of stuff, but we also have what I call the software-defined radio duck hunt. Uh, so come out and check out what that is, and then we also have a new software-defined radio challenge involving an electric shock collar for a dog. Um, so if you're into pain, that's also a thing. So told you guys I was a Morse code geek. This is a Morse code symbol for question mark. Uh, we've got about two minutes that we can take questions. In the meantime, here's the schedule for all the talks. It's going to be at the Wireless Village. It's also uh, Info Booth is going to be streaming it, and we're also going to be tweeting the talks uh, right before they start on our Twitter account. And before you ask the question, yes, we are going to be posting these slides 
on the wirelessvillage.ninja website. If you can remember wirelessvillage.ninja, everything is there. Just go to the base site. Uh, these slides will probably be up by sometime tonight. Uh, and we'll take questions, but we've got like two minutes. Yes? No. No. There are no age restrictions in the village. Yes. Uh, the frequency slide for offset or the uh, SIGIT. All right, come on up. All right, thanks, everyone. Have fun.